Okay. Thank you very much for joining us tonight here at the Dearborn Public Library uh, program. We're glad to be speaking with Isaac Butler. A uh, couple of quick things before we start. Uh, the, uh, what we'll be doing in the program tonight is uh, having a talk with, uh, between myself and Mr. Butler, uh, be uh, uh, talking about the book, uh, his new book, The Method, uh, the 20th Century Learned How learn to act, uh, and then we'll be glad to take uh, questions and answers afterwards. So either through the chat or you could uh, unmute yourself. And just one other thing, I wanna encourage everyone to join us on March 30, Thursday, March 31st uh, at 6.30 p.m. We'll be talking to Mr. Garrett Graff, author of Watergate, New York Times bestselling author, and about his new book, Watergate, a new history. So let's get started. Uh, do a quick intro for Mr. Butler. Isaac Butler is a co author with uh, Dan Coyce of the world's, uh, well, of this book, I should say, uh, of uh, the method of how the 20th century learned how to act. His previous book is The World Only Spins Forward, uh, co authored with Dan Coyce. Uh, it's about the ascent of, ascent of Angels in America, which NPR named one of the best books of 2018. Uh, Mr. Butler's writing has appeared in New York Magazine, Slate, uh, The Guardian, American Theater, and other publications. Uh, currently, he's, he hosts a podcast about the creative process called Working. Uh, he also Mr. Butler holds an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Minnesota and teaches theater his, history and performance at the New School, School in New York and elsewhere. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Mr. Butler. Hey, it's uh, a great pleasure. Yeah, mm -hmm. great, great to have you. Uh, really enjoyed your book. Uh, and I guess probably the best, I thought the best place to start is uh, how, what's the definition of me method acting? I mean, in, in five sentences, go. <laughs> that's, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, before I go any further, I, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. And, you know, um, I love the library. Libraries were very important to this book. I spent a lot of time in libraries researching it. You know, I love my neighborhood library in Brooklyn. And so it's, it's wonderful to do a library event. Um, if I could just request that everyone who's on this call, if you could please mute yourself, I can hear myself feeding back through. There's a couple people who are unmuted, I think. So if we could just take care of that, uh, it would be a little easier. Um, uh, anyway, to get on to the um, method and what it is and what it isn't, um, the the method the method's definition i think actually changes a bunch of times over the course of its life which is why the book is kind of complicated and why there's a lot of confusion over what the method is but for the most part the method is a series of uh techniques approaches ideas theories uh, based on the ideas of the Russian director, actor, and teacher, Konstantin Stanislavsky. And those ideas come over to the United States, and then there's many different versions of how those ideas are adapted in the United States. The one that is called The Method is the specific adaptations by Lee Strasberg, who was an acting teacher, director, and late-in-life Hollywood actor. And um, they are very, very focused on the internal mechanism of the actor on individuality and idiosyncrasy on the using your self digging really deep into your own psychology and emotionality and using that to uh, create the character now you, you talk about in the book uh, about the different acting styles styles before uh Stas Stanislavski and uh, his partner, uh, uh, how they came up with this system. I guess what uh, I was kind of curious because what was the acting style before they came up with it? Because it almost sounded like they were, all uh, the actors were like reaching for the back row. Uh, yeah. saying, uh, like saying, like, I am 
the moting back to the road. Yeah, I mean, to some in some instances, that's really correct. There was actually, you know, in Russia at the time, there were a number of different competing acting styles, some of which were more presentational and some of which were more mumbly and naturalistic. But, um, but they were all styles. It was all about externalities. And um, that's even true when Stanislavski founds the Moscow Art Theater with Vladimir Nemirovich Donchenko. And Nemirovich Donchenko and Stanislavski are trying to build a theater that is more naturalistic with a unified acting style with productions where the design are unified around the ideas of the director. And th those were all relatively new ideas. Prior to them, a uh, play would be rehearsed in Russia for like maybe nine times. They often didn't have directors. They often didn't have dress rehearsals. The sets they were doing it in front of were stock sets pulled out of storage. And they were very presentational and oratorical and kind of about, about showing off. Um, then the Moscow Art Theater arises to kind of pioneer a new, quieter, more internal, more realistic, naturalistic style. A few years after the Moscow Art Theater is founded, Stanislavski has a kind of crisis of faith in his own abilities as an actor. And that leads him to start developing this thing called the system, which then goes to the United States and becomes uh, the method. Uh, the system is really the first way, uh, the, the, the first technique of training the interior of the actor, the creative spirit of the actor, using the actor as material. Before then, it was all external. And what Stanislavski was trying to do was create a system that would train and use the internal mechanism of the actor as well as the external one. Um, at the same time, while they're doing that, you know, throughout a lot of Europe, there's still that really presentational style. You know, for much of the 19th century, you could literally... You know, if you were in Italy, you could buy a book called The Handbook of Theatrical Poses. And it would say, well, if you want to express grief on stage, you should do this. <laughs> and then you could sit there and practice it, you know, until you figured it out. Um, and that was changing in a lot of different places. But Stanislavski absolutely was part of the vanguard of that change. And uh, the, uh, he worked with um, uh, his fellow partner, Nick. Uh, to you spend like a day uh, coming up, uh, like a whole dinner, a whole lunch, lunch that went into dinner and came up with a system. Uh, now, the actors, uh, I mean, it was hard. How, how did the actors react to this new system? Well, originally, they're not doing the system. That happens a few years later. When they're founding the theater, they're trying to find actors who agree with them. They want like-minded actors who want to do more, who want to take acting more seriously as an art form and who want to take literature more seriously, the literature of playwriting. And so they all... Um, for the most part, it was all right. It goes okay. There's a couple actors who aren't into it and Stanislavski kind of, uh, well, he just kind of forces them to do things in a more restrained way and it's 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 very successful. Um, but once Stanislavski starts pioneering the system and particularly once he starts using the rehearsal hall to experiment with his acting theories, the um, actors at the Moscow Art Theater get really pissed at him. They don't want to do it. They're established actors. They're famous. They're very skilled. They're very good at what they do. They already know what they're doing. They don't feel a need to experiment. And so Stanislavski turns to the younger generation of actors, the people who are kind of, you know, the interns at the Moscow Art Theater, the apprentices at the Moscow Art Theater. Um, he turns to them and he says, hey, you know, why don't I train you in this? And they get very excited by it. And the uh... But it, uh, he really re rehearsed them a lot. Uh, there was, uh, there was uh, one of the plays he rehearsed 180 times, I believe yeah. you, you said. He rehearsed Hamlet for three years. I mean, he really was going off the deep end with this stuff, you know? And for anyone who's ever done, if you've ever done theater professionally, you know, if you're listening to this, you know, like you, you rehearse it for four weeks. You, the idea that you would rehearse a play for three years is, is just sounds like madness to me anyway. But he came up with uh, some innovative ideas like the fourth wall. Uh, how do you half sets almost to, to bring in people's imagination? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
uh, different innovations like that, uh, which are quite remarkable. Yes, he was an incredible innovator. And, you know, even before he starts working on the system, he invents what became sort of the modern rehearsal process. You know, the idea that you would sit around a table and deconstruct the play together and figure out what every line means collectively, literally around a table. It's called table work. That's something we do to this day in the United States. Uh, you know, his original rehearsal process that was sort of evenly divided in fourths between table work staging the show, refining the staging, and then doing run-throughs to kind of fine-tune everything. That's how most plays are rehearsed today, you know? He um, really pioneered what a director could do in terms of having a unified vision of the play that's reflected in both the performances and the design. Um, he invented, to some extent, the idea of the permanent ensemble. So the Mas Moscow Art Theater, all the actors were full-time employees of the theater. And they rehearsed together, they trained together, they went away on summer retreats together. You know, they, they really shared a common goal of what they were all working towards. And... Um, you know, that, that that became a huge influence beyond the Moscow Art Theater. Once he starts working on the system, he pioneers a lot of other stuff that's very important to this day. The modern way that we break down scripts, that we think about how dialogue works, that we um, think about how dramatic action works and how stories are structured on stage and really on TV and film as well. All of that comes from Stanislavski. And that's all stuff that he figures out while working on the system. But yeah, the well, most, I... the most the, the sort of famous of his ideas, which would become very controversial in the United States, is this one of effective memory. And he's borrowing that from a French psychologist uh, named Theodule Ribot. Stanislavski never read Freud. He didn't know anything about psychoanalysis. But uh, Ribot writes about how um, you have a memory for the emotions associated with things that happen to you. Just like you have a visual memory or an auditory memory or any other kind of memory, you have an emotional memory, which he called affective memory. And so Stanislavski started experimenting with ways that you could sort of trigger these past emotions or remember these past emotions and use them uh, to create a character. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I like how uh, you said the, where the scripts were broken down into beats. Uh, where, okay, this is an action. Uh, this, okay, I have to iron clothes or I am going to open a door. Uh, sort of like, uh, it's like a puzzle piece. This after this after this. Uh, but uh, I guess that was one thing. Uh, that's one thing about uh, the whole method. I just would, I can't. If I brought up, say, like the death of my death of a loved one, how I felt like this, and you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and it's it's to me it almost it's almost like you're preventing yourself from getting old, uh, adjusting to it, uh, saying, getting through it, saying, okay, this happened, but having to bring it up again, it just after and yeah. after that's such a challenge. You know, there are two, excuse me, there are two, sorry about that. There are two dangers of sitting here talking to a microphone all day. The, uh, there are dangers, um, there are two dangers with effective memory that people um, figure out pretty early on and then consistently criticize the practice and still do to this day. One is that, that you're preventing meaningful catharsis in your own life, right? That you're preventing, um, moving on you're dwelling in all the muck you know um and that there's something a little un there's something potentially unhealthy about that but the other problem is that what if you use that memory over and over again and you kind of wear it out and it's not useful anymore to you like the emotion goes cold do you know what i mean like okay. like you exhaust the possibility of that memory and then have you maybe cheapened that memory you know, because now it's sort of drained of all of its emotional meaning for you. That was another critique. So it's sort of either way. There's risks in either direction, um, which is a kind of fascinating thing. I get what you're saying. I, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to think about that uh, because that's, you're making a valid point. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if I 
I do writing for personal writing and also per writing for work. And uh, I fall back on the old cliche, writing what you know. Right. Uh, uh, it just, it, and you, you bring it yourself alive. You bring the page alive. So it's, it's sort of like a double-edged sword. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, obviously I, I spend most of my time writing. I mean, I haven't really acted in like 20 years, um, but uh, I was a director for a while after that. And then now I, I spend most of my time writing, but you know, yeah, any creative pursuit has its emotional component, I think, you know, and figuring out how to manage that emotional component is, is a major part of the journey of being an artist, of creating something. You know, I've certainly written things that called up really difficult emotion. I wasn't doing that on purpose. I wasn't doing exercises to feel that emotion, but just writing about something will call something up and it makes you feel this really complicated, difficult way. And, you know, do you let that ruin your day? Do you take a walk around the block? Do you, you know, what, what do you do? Yeah. How do you handle that? How do you manage right. that? I mean, that even happened a couple places with this book. When I was writing about the death of Stanislavski, when I was writing about Stanislavski's death and shortly after he died, one of his protégés, um, was arrested by Stalin's government and just disappeared to the great terror. He was in the gulag for like six months. And then he, I think he was beaten to death. I mean, he died really terribly. Um, I, you know, I, it's just like a one page part of the book. I wrote it in one sitting, you know, the normal way. It's not like I was calling up the emotions. I'm just sitting there typing, 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 typing. And then, uh, but when it was over, I was really upset. It was made me really sad to write about Stanislavski dying. I mean, he led a very good life. He lived to be very old, you know, <laughs> but it was still, it still moved me in a weird way to think about. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, and then Stanis back to Stanislavski, he th tried to uh, get get at the God particles. He, he the the way the creative uh, uh, feeling, creative force in everybody. I guess maybe that's and correct me if I'm wrong. That's what the system was kind of after. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Uh, and uh, and how how everybody to get at that. And, and some, sometimes it was, I imagine it was hard for people. Very hard. You know, so where the system begins is Stanislavski has this crisis and the crisis is a very normal one that happens to actors all the time. He's on stage, he's doing a part and he's just doesn't feel any of it. You know, like he's going through the motions, but it has no soul. Most actors would be like, yeah, that happens every now and then. It's called a matinee. Like, it's, it's like, just, <laughs> just go back to work. But Stanislavski, that was a re he was a relentless perfectionist and was so hard on himself. He just couldn't accept that. And so he wanted, he basically realized that one of the things that separated acting from other art forms, and I should say that one of his, you know, real things that he's doing during his, his life is trying to argue that actors are artists, are they're artists in their own right, which was a controversial opinion then. Um, but unlike a painter or a writer, you know, we're, we're writers, right? So it's like, if I sit down at the computer in the morning and I'm not feeling it, I can go do some other stuff and come back until I am feeling it. Uh, an actor doesn't have that. Uh, they have to feel it at the moment. They have to be inspired on command at the exact right time and so he was trying to develop a way that you could be inspired that you could feel that creative force that you were just talking about which was kind of like the god particle to him that you could do it on demand but there's a problem with that which is that um that actually can't be like what that is we don't know what that is it can't be described in language on some level inspiration the creative spirit it exists beyond the the limits of our own consciousness and perception and so what he's trying to figure out is a series of, of techniques and ideas and ways of thinking about creativity that will allow you to um, interact with that aspect of yourself that exists beyond conscious thought. And the reason why in the book I use the metaphor of the God particle is that it's sort of like the experiments that prove the existence of the Higgs boson. We can't actually see the Higgs boson. There's no way to do that. What you can do is create something that the Higgs boson then interacts with and you can see that interaction and that's how you know it's there. And so he's trying to do something very similar with the, the art of acting. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Anton 
Anton Chekhov was uh, uh, a big part of the Moscow Art Theater uh, yeah. system. Uh, uh, and one of the big, biggest uh, uh, productions of his plays was uh, Siegel. Uh, and he, he also, they also did the Uncle Vanya uh, and I believe one other play. And it was and it was interesting how how you how you put it how you started off he, he wasn't a, uh, a well known well known author he's kind of disheveled he's all uh, and uh, and uh, he's his plays are bought to get his plays are are heralded by the by the theater and they're very well uh, produced famous productions to the point where the insignia of the Moscow Art Theater is a seagull. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Chekhov was an acclaimed prose writer of short stories and novellas. Um, and of course was also a country doctor, but he was, he was an acclaimed beloved writer of short stories and novellas, but he was not taken seriously as a playwright. Um, prior to the Moscow Art Theater. He had written of some plays, but one of the reasons why he was not taken seriously is that he had this play, The Seagull, and the first production of The Seagull, I, I go into kind of the whole story in the book, but the shorthand is, you know, it's one of the most notorious critical flops in the history of Russian theater up until that point. That original production of The Seagull in St. Petersburg is like that Tommy Wiseau film, The Room, you know, it was so bad you had to be there. People were shouting, literally shouting things at the stage by the end of it. They hated it so much. So the only person who really believed in that play, Chekhov didn't even believe in that play anymore. He said, I'll never write a play if I live to be 700 years old. And then uh, Vladimir Nemirovich Donchenko was really the only person in Russia, it feels like, who believed in that play. He went and he said to Chekhov, I love this play. I'm starting this new theater with uh, Konstantin Stanislavsky. We want to do our the best plays and give them the best productions you know the smartest directors we're going to treat them sensitively and your plays at the top of our list and Chekhov said you can't do it I don't want you to do it this play ruined me and you know Nemirovich Danchenko said well if you're my friend if you're really my friend you'll let me do the play he manipulates <laughs> him into it and then Chekhov gives him the rights to do the play um they really struggled with the production at first Stanislavski didn't understand the play at all but yeah it be and you know uh but that first season, it's the play that secured their finances. They were about to go out of business, really, until that production came along. It secured their finances. It secured their prestige. The audience went so wild for it. In Russia at that time, they took curtain calls in between each act, and the seagull has four acts. And the audience went so wild for it that at the end of the third act, during the third act curtain call, they start screaming, author, author, author. And they have to tell the audience that, that Chekhov isn't there because Chekhov has tuberculosis. So he's spending the winter in Yalta. And the audience says, send him a telegram, send him a telegram. And they have to run out and send him a telegram of congratulations. Um, Chekhov became their star dramatist. After The Seagull, they did Uncle Vanya, which was an older play. It's actually maybe my favorite play not written by Shakespeare, my, my personal one. I love Uncle Vanya. It's, it's really a brilliant play. And then he writes two plays for them, uh, his two other major plays, The Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard, both of which, you know, and in the process of his time with the Moscow Art Theater, he falls in love with one of the actresses in the company, Olga Knipper. And Olga Knipper um, becomes Olga Knipper Chekova. They get married, uh, and and you know they they have this really beautiful um, relationship. And they spend, a, but they have to spend a lot of it apart because he can't go to the cold parts of the country during the winter. And so um, there's actually a wonderful collection of their letters to each other that you can that you can buy. It's called Dear Writer, Dear Actress, because a lot wow. of their romance happened over letter. And um, it's really beautiful. And, uh, you know, Olga Knipper-Chekova was a star actor at the Moscow Art Theater for the rest of her life. Well, the, and the theater was able to survive during World War One or the beginnings of World War One due to their connections that I believe Stanislavski had, uh, the, and they were able to, but eventually, but eventually the uh, Russian Revolution and uh, it fell uh, a fall of uh, Stalin, and uh, some of uh, 
lot of the players had to make uh, do like go to go to America, like they did a theater tour of Europe that was eventually that that was going to make it to America, and it's and uh, eventually it drew fame. You tell about how it drew fame in America uh, for different things like talks, like the, uh, Richard uh, Bolshevsky's talks uh, about the kind of lit the flame here in America. Like yeah. started off uh, like the American Laboratory Theater uh, got people really interested in the method here in, in the U.S. Yeah, I mean... You know, one of the remarkable things about the Moscow Art Theater is that it survives two different czars, the failed revolution of 1905, the successful revolution of 1917, the rise of Lenin, the Russian Civil War, and Stalin. It survives all that stuff. I mean, and so does Stanislavski. I mean, he dies of old age at home of, of a heart attack. Um it's a remarkable, it's remarkable that that theater and that most of the people associated with it survived, but the political currents affected the theater in a number of different ways. You know, one of the ones before they got to America is some members of the Moscow Art Theater were on tour when the Russian Civil War started, and they got cut off from Moscow by the white army, by the anti-communist army, and they wound up separated from the Moscow Art Theater for literally years. You know, they yeah. uh, went to Prague and started their own theater company in Prague called the Prague, you know, group of the Moscow Art Theater. Anyway, Richard Boleslavsky, who's a protege of Stanislavsky's um, and a director and actor, very successful within the theater at that. He is an officer in World War One. He's a sir, he's a Polish Lancer. Boleslavsky came from Poland. Yeah. You know, he, he serves in the Polish Lancers. And when the revolution comes, he escapes back to Moscow, where he lives under his stage name, which was Boleslavsky. He had a Polish name that he enlisted under. So the people wouldn't know that he was an officer in World War One because Russian, you know, Russian army officers in World War One did not last very long after the revolution. And uh he was not a communist. And once the civil war starts breaking out, he and his wife flee the country because they just realize eventually he's going to be denounced to the authorities. He's probably going to be arrested. And so they flee the country. They bounce around for a while and they wind up in America. Um, shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, the finances of the MAT are very bad. Um, political currents are kind of turning against them. And so they decide to go on tour of the United States. And they bounce around Europe for a little bit and they go to the U.S. And it's sort of hard to oversell what a huge impact the first year of their tour in the United States made. They stuck around for a second year and they overstayed their welcome and that didn't work out. But that first year, everyone, it was like the Beatles, you know, landing at the airport with the girls screaming and going on Ed Sullivan. It was kind of the equivalent of that. Their first performance on Broadway gets a 30 minute standing ovation if you've ever seen a play with a standing ovation it's usually like two minutes mm -hmm. long right so yeah, imagine yeah. that but for 30 minutes you know they're just taking curtain call after curtain call after curtain call they become pop culture figures and everyone wants to know well how is this company doing this amazing stuff and the answer to some extent is the system so Boleslavsky, with stanislavsky's permission starts giving lectures in what the system is and what it includes and very soon that turns into a school called the American Laboratory Theater, which only lasts for about 10 years. But in those 10, actually less than 10 years, seven years, but in that, maybe even less than that. But every time I say it, it's going to get smaller and smaller. It lasted six months. No, it lasted a few, you know, it lasted for about, uh, let's say seven years. And in that time, it trains a bunch of really important teachers and actors and directors who would go on to spread the, the gospel of Stanislavski throughout the United States. And a few of those folks found the group theater. Um, and the group theater in the 1930s is really where the method is born. Lee Strasberg uh, is the co-artistic director of the group theater along with Harold Klerman and the producer Cheryl Crawford. And th that is really the environment in which the method's born. Yeah, that's... a uh... Uh, it's was a, well, a number of interesting things uh, uh, that uh, Aaron Copeland, who I love this music, was roommates of Harold Clareman. 
Yeah, they were cousins and lifelong best friends. Claire, uh, Copeland was the best man at Clermont's wedding. Um, you know, they they met, they were cousins by marriage. So they didn't know each other growing up, but they met as roommates in Paris because Clermont had gone to the Sorbonne and uh, Clermont, uh, Clermont, sorry, had gone to the Sorbonne and Copeland was there studying composition. Yeah, the uh, all these famous people started the, uh, started in this group uh, yeah and i mean everyone's just... got to start somewhere right oh yeah but... yeah yeah right uh and uh they go off to uh i believe it was connecticut uh to come up with uh plays of their own the, at least the first year i believe and it wasn't there was one successful one but for the most part it was I just remember you mentioning a lot of arguing. A lot of arguing, yeah. So they, the group did a series of summer retreats. They would do their season and they would go away for the summer to work and train and rehearse and uh, think through their mission and stuff like that. And the first one is in Brookfield, Connecticut. And uh, they actually kept a diary of their time there, which is in the Library of Congress. And so I've, I've read wow. it, uh, which is really, so you get to see minute by minute what they're doing. And there's oh. weird ongoing jokes that start developing. And of course, people are starting to pair off and have sex yeah. and, you know, become, you know, two of them get married not that long after, you know, so, so all that ferment is in that diary. And um, they, you know, they really alternate success with failure. They often have a success and they have an, uh, uh, an immediate flop, you know, um, uh, and they have a couple of really big hits. Uh, the first one is Sidney Kingsley's, excuse me, Sidney Kingsley's Method in White, which wins the Pulitzer Prize uh, and runs runs for so long that it becomes the first play on Broadway to compete with the, its own film adaptation. Like it runs wow. for so long with the film out of it, you know. They, um, and of course, one of their members is Clifford Odets, you know, who starts as an actor and then becomes a writer within the group. And so they were the launching pad for Clifford Odets and those really brilliant, you know, Awake and Sing, Waiting for Lefty, uh, Paradise Lost, Golden Boy, you know, his four best plays uh, happen within the group. So, um, but yes, as you said, a lot of my book is about the arguments that they have because they argued constantly. They were com comfortable with a level of conflict that I think we would be shocked by. They just spent, if they disagree with each other, they just get into a screaming match about it and then they go back to work. So they were just fighting, um, fighting constantly, you know? They were just fighting all the time. And some of those fights were meaningful and lasted for the rest of their lives. And some of them were just that day's argument. I mean, they were also, they did not have the same boundaries we would expect between personal life and professional life. They were also all drinking a lot. So there's a lot, you know, of, and it's young people and their creative ferment. So there's a lot going on between them during that time period. And that, the, uh, and they have another season uh, and then they bring, and then they sort of go their separate ways uh, yeah. because because they they each uh, have their own interest and they just yeah. they they they, they uh, go off uh, uh, do these roles do theater and uh, I remember uh, Fran Traton, he went off he said yeah oh, I've gone Hollywood. Uh, I'm going to go to Hollywood and marry a famous actress. And then he did. He went to Hollywood and became a star and he married Joan Crawford. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> that part. Yeah. And actually he, you know, um, yeah. So the group starts peeling off members who go to Hollywood pretty quickly. Franchet Tone lasts a couple seasons. A guy named J. Edward Bromberg lasts a couple more. There's a point where they all get um, really fed up with being in the group and they take a six month hiatus. And during that six month hiatus, a whole group of them, Haha, ha. a subgroup go to Hollywood. <laughs> Stella Adler, Harold Clerman, Lee Strasberg, Leah Kazan, uh, you know, and a bunch of others go to Hollywood. Morris Karnofsky, Phoebe Brand, a bunch of them go and they sort of take their screen tests and they, the many of the Jewish members get nose jobs and they change their names and they start acting in films and, and all sorts of stuff. But then a group, uh, uh, some of those folks come back and go back to the group. Um, Clifford Odets, of course, became a Hollywood screenwriter. Um, John Garfield uh, quits the group um, and becomes the first Method movie star in the late 1930s. But then when the group cracks up for good, because that company lasts a decade, when it cracks up for good, 
a lot of those folks go to Hollywood and they became incredibly important and influential in Hollywood. The most important and influential of all is of course, Aaliyah Kazam, who over the course of the forties and into the fifties becomes the most important and arguably the best American stage and screen director simultaneously, something no one has ever done before or since. He's the best at both of them. He's the most important and well-respected at both of them at the same time, which is a truly remarkable feat. Uh, and he really helped spread the gospel of the method at Stanislavski, you know, as he's doing that. Uh, as a theater director yourself, uh, how, I guess, how uh, how would the that and a film director be? How the, would their? My point is that I, my point is I want to see uh, to emphasize how because how quite an accomplishment Kazan yeah. uh, did be being a there, theater director and a film director. They're two different. They're two different things, right? They're two radically different things. I mean, I think that. You know, Kazam was lucky in that his first movie was done while the, you know, under the studio system. So, you know, there's someone supervising him as he's directing. He's not editing the film himself. Someone else is. You know, he learned a lot on that first movie, which is a really good movie. A tree, His adaptation of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. It's really quite moving. Um, and he, you know, learned a lot through that, that he then applied moving forward. I mean, screen directing and stage directing are very different. They're completely different art forms. They use a lot of the same skills. They're called the same thing, but they're really, really different. And becoming a master of both of those is, is no easy feat. There's very few people who are able to do it. There's lots of wonderful stage directors who make terrible screen directors because they don't understand the all the, the you know, it just looks too stagey. They don't understand how to use a camera. They don't understand how to use an editing booth. And there's plenty of screen directors who try, I mean, there's fewer now, but there are screen directors who've tried their hand at theater directing and it hasn't gone very well. You know, they're re just really different skills. Yeah. So they, uh, it was Lee Strasberg, I believe Lee Strasberg, uh, and they created the, there was a creation of the actor's studio as a way to uh, keep your, practice acting like uh like you an athlete would train like an athlete yes. would run a race uh, uh practice or boxing or swimmer would practice swimming uh, uh find it was a way to create create keep your keep your skills up yeah, that's actually a really great metaphor. Um, I, I sometimes talk about it in terms of tennis because I'm a big tennis nut. But uh, but yes, that's a great that's a great metaphor. Um, Stanislavski called it training and drill. It's all the stuff you do when you're not doing the play. <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta keep your you gotta keep sharp. You know, you gotta keep the the muse going. You gotta keep up. You gotta keep in shape internally and externally. So. Um, Aliyah Kazam about a de you know a few 19 late 1940s so the group's been it's been about six seven years since the then since the group cracked up and Kazan realizes that he misses that camaraderie and that sense of constant training and improvement in what the group kind of enabled its artists to do so he and two other members of the group Cheryl Crawford and Bobby Lewis co-found the actor studio to do this very thing to provide this home for training and drill in between jobs um, Bobby Lewis and they, they actually deliberately freeze Lee Strasberg out at the beginning. Kazan had a really kind of Oedipal relationship with, with Strasberg where he would reject him and then get close to him, reject him and then get close to him. Um, so they freeze Strasberg out at the beginning, but within a year, Bobby Lewis quits the actor studio because he and Kazan and have a huge falling out. Lewis feels that Kazan steals a directing opportunity from him. Uh, and they have a huge falling out. Um, and so they need another acting teacher to come in and Kazan brings in a bunch of different people, actually. Meisner does it for a little bit. Anyway, lots of other people do it. And eventually Kazan settles on Strasberg. And then Kazan realizes he doesn't really want to be training actors all the time. He wants to direct plays and films. He wants to focus on that full time. And he wants to leave the studio. And so he puts Lee in charge of it. Lee becomes the head of the studio and uh, Kazam becomes its president. And, um, and that is the thing 
that has, you know, that's the event that Lee Strasberg takes it over and the, the actor studio becomes the kind of Vatican of the method, you know, from the early 1950s on it's his home and every week he's training people there. And that's where the method really um, spreads throughout American pop culture. Yeah. Uh, they now they would in the actor's studio and the classes and like the advanced class, or maybe correct me if I'm wrong, the beginning class, they would present like little, do little skits, do little yeah. uh, uh, like uh, sing a song, uh, iron clothes or something, something that they, uh, to keep in shape, I guess. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, when the actor studio starts, it's something a little different from what it becomes. When the actor studio starts, there's the beginner's class. Cloris Leachman is in that class, you know? Uh, so yeah, wow. again, you've got to start somewhere. Um, and then there's an advanced class. Kazan's taking the beginners. Bobby Lewis is taking the advanced students. And the advanced students include some very, very, very important members of who, people who would go on. They weren't them, but they would go on to become very, very important members of of film and, and theater. I mean, Jerome Robbins, uh, you know, was a member wow. of the, you know, um, uh, Montgomery Clift, Marlon Brando, you know, th those are the kind of people we're talking about. And then um, when Lee, and they would do all sorts of different stuff. Some days they would do exercises. Some days they would do scene studies. They worked on plays. They did all sorts of different stuff. When Lee takes it over, he consolidates those two classes into one class that meets twice a week. And he stops calling it a class and uh, he stops calling it a school. It's not a school. It's like a gymnasium, right? And what, what he does is he then, what uh, during those sessions, which are every Tuesday and Thursday, and the sessions are two hours long and there are two slots to present, okay? And what you do, if you were a member of the actor studio is you would sign up for one of those two slots months in advance to present something. That something could be a scene. That something could be a monologue. It could be an exercise. It could be any number of different things. You're just working on something and you want feedback on that thing that you are working on. And then um, Strasberg would critique it. That's what, that's what, that's was, that becomes the model. They present and then the audience, the other members of the studio and especially Strasberg critique it. It becomes sort of like, uh, fiction workshop in an MFA program almost. And then uh, like the the real the standouts of uh, the classes are of Marlon Brando and uh, James James Dean, though for different reasons. Brando was just so talent, just so uh, unique, un yeah. talent uh, himself and James Dean, uh, because he almost, he, again, talent, but uh, he just, everybody just, he felt very insecure, very awkward, according to the, the, you, you say in your book. Yeah, I mean, so Brando starts the studio in that initial class, but, uh, you know, weird thing, because Brando would become more associated with the method than any actor who's ever lived. Brando actually didn't like Strasberg. He was trained by Stella Adler. He did not use effective memory. He was not into Lee Strasberg's approach. And so after Strasberg took over the actor's studio, um, Brando really distanced himself from it. I mean, he would go to, he would help out at fundraisers and stuff like that, but he, he was not actively involved in the studio and he was not really a student of Strasberg, but because he had been a founding member of the actor studio and membership of the studios for life, Strasberg kind of took credit for him. And Brando was very angry at him about that for basically the rest of his life. Um, James Dean is a curious case because it's very unclear how much Dean took from the studio, how much he understood, because he almost never presented work there. He presented work, really, he only presented work once at the studio. Um, and Strasberg's response to the work he presented at the studio was so excoriating. It was so tough. The feedback was so brutal that James Dean never presented work for Strasberg ever again. Uh, Dean was deeply insecure. He was a deeply vulnerable, fragile guy. And he just didn't want to go through that again. Um, Strasberg's approach was very excoriating and it was not for everyone. Um, Dean faced allegations during his life that he was stylistically was just plagiarizing 
Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. I mean, Marlon Brando said that about James Dean. He said, after watching East of Eden, he said, that kid's wearing my last year's wardrobe and using my last year's talent, you know? Yeah. Um, and if you watch a bunch of Brando movies in a row and then watch a bunch of watch James Dean's three movies in a row, which I did, um, the accusation feels kind of right. I mean, in East of Eden and Rebel Without a Cause, it really does seem like he's channeling, copying Brando. It's only in Giant, which is actually, I think, Dean's best film. And I think Dean is quite good in Giant, a very underrated uh, George Stevens movie starring Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor, which I think a lot of people don't watch today because it feels like it is 19 hours long. It's like three and a half hours yeah. long. You know, it's a beautiful movie, though. And James Dean is quite good in it. And I think that's the thing that points to the future that if Dean had you know, assuming he didn't drink himself to death, that he could have been a really interesting special actor. But I think at the beginning, he's, you know, a young guy imitating the older generation you know, in a way. And then the, uh, you point out how the library, Hollywood studios would sell their past libraries to the license to show movies on, on TV. And there was a great demand for uh, drama uh, programs in response to it, not how all these uh, uh, studio uh, 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 studio actor uh, got. There was quite a demand for it. Uh, uh, Paul Newman, uh, uh, Martin Ritt, uh, Rod Steiger. Uh, I didn't know uh, he started the role of Marty. Uh, all these, yeah. all, the, all these. There was such a demand that the uh, the normal looking uh, act person, the normal, it became normal. The method yeah. was accepted, was normalized. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a very important step in the method's history that I think is kind of overlooked because there's a way in which we've really neglected the live TV drama movement, which was short-lived, but was really important. It only lasted, you know, its heyday was only about four years long. Um, but yes, so the movie studios are licensing all their back catalog to show on TV. And um, that has a couple of effects. One of them is that people who grow up in that era, directors like the Coen brothers, for example, you know, they grow up able to see all sorts of movies on television, all sorts of classic film. You can get a film education by sitting in front of your TV at night, you know, but the, but the other thing that happens is um networks start to try to figure out uh, stuff that they can license to the stations that will compete with it, you know, because the studios are licensing to the individual stations. Uh, and so the networks need their own material and they come up with this stuff that's live TV drama. So they're repurposing radio studios as sets and the things are filmed and broadcast live, which is why a lot of them don't survive to this day because they weren't recorded. Um, uh, there were there until some of them eventually were recorded, but you know, it's not like people were, they, they're being broadcast. They're not being dumped onto film, you know, they wouldn't it's, think to it. Yeah. So there's people literally the way they were recorded is you, they pointed a 16 millimeter camera at a screen that's showing it. That's, that's how they've been preserved. The ones that have been preserved. Um, method actors were absolutely key to this movement. The members of the actor studio were really really dominant uh, in the live TV drama movement for a number of reasons. One, live TV dramas were in New York and the actor studio was in New York and all of those actors were in New York. Two, a lot of those actors were quasi, not officially, but quasi blacklisted. So they couldn't work in Hollywood. And so, you know, they were working in New York and, and this was a way for them to, they weren't officially on the blacklist. They just, it was just known that you couldn't employ them because people thought that the actor studio was affiliated with the group. And so there was something quasi communistic about it. Um, but also the thing that method actors were really good at was improvising and staying in character, no matter what was going on around them. And live TV drama, there's all this schmata going on around you. There's cameras moving literally the only way you would know that the camera wasn't showing on you anymore is that a stage manager would crawl over and tug the cuff of your pants like that. <laughs> and then what you would do is you would run, 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 run to where your next scene is. And you're throwing your clothes off and putting another thing on. Then you have to come in and be in character and give a good performance. And that was something the method actors truly, truly excelled at that. And so they really took over and the, the king and queen of 
live TV drama were actors to two actor studio members, Rod Steiger, who went on to win an Oscar for uh, In the Heat of the Night, and Kim Stanley, who only made six movies. Um, and so her legacy is kind of lost a little bit. Um, but Kim Stanley was in the middle of the 20th century regarded as the greatest living actress, particularly on stage. She was the female Brando. That's what they called her. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, Frances. Uh, I wasn't she yeah. in Frances. She was yeah. in Frances. She plays the mother. She plays the mother in Frances, and uh, Jessica Lange plays uh, uh, Frances. Trish. Yeah, and um, Jessica Lange was her acting student. Wow! So you're actually getting to watch an acting teacher and an acting student work together in Frances, and then they did it again in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Wow! Yeah. It, one of the great things I. Uh, took from your book was that I had a view of method acting, which is about this, but in reality, it's like a family, it's like a family tree. Like when you yeah. do your family uh, genealogical tree, it's all these branches with uh, uh, all the students who worked with Reese Strasberg was one approach, and then they taught the, their students the approach and the, the same with Stella Adler and mm -hmm. the same with Sanford Miser, all these, uh, it was, yeah, like a branch that had for the most part, the method maybe at the, at the core of it, but different approaches of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Stanis the Stanislavski system gives birth to a bunch of different ideas of acting training in the United States. Um, and they're, um, it might feel like the narcissism of petty differences or something, you know, there's a lot of infighting between these teachers. Um, even though I think if you take the, you know, the, the 7,000 foot view that they're all after the same thing. They're all after the actor, you know, feeling really alive and in the moment and like they're experiencing what the character is experiencing. But their methods of getting there are very, very different. Lee Strasberg's focused on psychology and emotion in the interior of the actor. Uh, Stella Adler is focused on research and script analysis and the imagination of the actor. Stanford Meisner is focused on um, how to get the actor to kind of forget that they're acting and to just be alive in the present moment and spontaneous and responding to what's happening in front of them. Um, Uta Hagen uh, and Bobby Lewis are both sort of hybrids of these different approaches. So, um, and then by the 1970s, those teachers are training every actor, every American actor is, you know, when you get to the new Hollywood movement, you know, uh, which starts with the graduate and ends with Raging Bull and Gate of, Gates of Heaven and, uh, excuse me, Heaven's Gate. Um, uh, all of those actors have trained with at least one of those, if not more than one of those yeah. teachers. You know, Al Pacino, Ellen Burstyn, Robert De Niro, Diane Keaton, James Caan. Um, you know, it's very hard to find an actor who didn't train with one of them. Uh, you know, Altman tends to use actors who weren't, but almost everyone else is using people who are trained by, by, by one or both of those teachers. Now, uh, part of your book, uh, or at least correct me if I'm wrong, kind of, Kind of says uh, Robert De Niro is not a method actor. Uh, and... Like Brando, Robert De Niro is claimed as a method actor by the actor's studio in Lee Strasberg. And in fact, if you buy Lee Strasberg's posthumously released book, A Dream of Passion, it says on the back of it, Robert De Niro, Marlon Brando, a few other big names. These are some of the many people Lee Strasberg has taught. Um, Robert De Niro was a member of the actor studio. Uh, uh, Al Pacino, his good friend, you know, they've been good friends and sort of friendly rivals through their whole professional career. They have very sort of similar um, beginnings. Both of them were abandoned, but both of them were children of divorce. Their father, their parents split up. Uh, in Al Pacino's case, the father really, you know, he didn't really know his father. Uh, it, they both dropped out of high school to pursue acting. Um, Al Pacino dropped out of high school to pursue acting at HB Studio. Robert De Niro dropped out of high school to pursue acting with Stella Adler. And he didn't like Stella Adler very much. Stella Adler had a very big, very theatrical personality. And it, I find it very charming, but it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. But he took her ideas 
um, and he of how you create a character. And he pushed those about as far as they could go. So to him, acting wasn't about psychology. It was about behavior. And so when he was playing a part, he would break down the script really closely. He would do um, months and months and months of research. He would interview relevant people. He would learn the physical habits of the role. So if he was playing a baseball player, he would learn how to play baseball and chew tobacco. If he was learning, if he was going to be a boxer, he'd learn how to box and he'd adopt a boxing training regimen. You know, he would rewrite the scripts himself. He would buy props and costumes that felt like the character and he would wear them to help him be in character. Uh, he wouldn't break character on set. He would asked to be referred to the characters by the character's name you know all of this stuff and all of that is today because of robert de niro we think that that is the method you know if you read a news article about an actor and you see the term method they're talking really about a version of a process that's related to robert de niro but robert de niro wasn't really a method actor yeah like uh how benedict cumberbatch and the uh Power of the Dog movie. He, yeah, he he uh, kept in character so much that uh, Jane Campion said, "Oh, you'll meet Benedict after the movie. He's a nice yeah. guy." <laughs> Which is sort of similar to, you know, Michael Moriarty, who um, co-starred in Bang the Drum Slowly with Robert De Niro, went to visit him on set of Taxi Driver, right? And someone yeah. said something about, you know, oh. Uh, um, you know, what's it like seeing your, he's, and he said something like, I don't know that man, that man's Travis Pickle. You know, I know Robert De Niro from Bang the Drum Slowly, and he's a completely different person now because he was so in character. So yeah, I mean, it's a very similar kind of thing. And that's what, uh, uh, before reading your book, that's what I, that's the kind of uh, uh, thing I had in mind as yeah. being a method actor. Totally. I mean, that's what the public thinks the method is. And, you know, I don't want to be pedantic about it. If that, that's real, everyone, that's sort of the public definition of it, you know, but I do think that there is another definition of it, which is the kind of private one, the one that like, if you actually took a method acting class, what you would actually learn, which is mostly Strasberg's technique. And I like uh, your theory uh, that you kind of touch on in the book how acting styles kind of refer, reflect the current time. Uh, yes. Like like how uh, Montgomery Cliff, uh, uh, he and similar actors were current, were popular at that time. Uh, Dustin Hoffman mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, how uh, the, they reflect like normal people. And now it's, I think you said something like a, a, a acting style that there's a lot of almost like muck, I think, or is are just uh, the and acting styles now want to bring that out to, to make sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the project of American filmmaking in the 70s is that we're discovering this really gross underbelly of Nixon's America, you know, of America under under Nixon and during the Vietnam War and during uh, Watergate. And then you have the church committee, which starts uncover in the Senate, which uncovers all of these truly shocking crimes against its own people that the U.S. government was doing. I mean, to give one example, um, the U.S. government was um, trying to pioneer mind control and the way they were doing it was um taking unsuspecting civilians who had sought psychiatric care and uh un, you know giving them lsd against their will you know that's one of the that's and then they would put them into comas to see what would happen to their brain i mean that's the sort of thing that so uh, american filmmaking during that time period is really interested in making sense of and finding the truth and so it's digging down deep to find the truth which is what the method is after that um, particularly once Reagan is the president and we sort of try to, you know, make America great again, which was a slogan that he used at one point. Um, Hollywood anyway, gets less interested in that project of telling the truth. Um, and the acting styles begin to shift. When you look at today, 
part because all of those charismatic gurus, Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, and the rest are all dead. You know, it's hard to maintain a, a dogma when your when your original prophet has died, right? And yeah. so, uh, and and we live at a time in our, our culture where there isn't consensus about any aspect of American civic life, and so there's no consensus about acting either. So what you see is a lot. Of, what what you see is a lot of different styles, a lot of different ways of approaching acting and making a character and a lot of different ways that that can look. And I actually find that very exciting. I think diversity of approach can be really thrilling. I'm glad that we live in an age where you can see someone as anti-realistic as Nicolas Cage, right? And someone as, uh, um, you know, technically accomplished as Meryl Streep and someone as, you know, realistic as, Oscar Isaac, you know, I just like that we live in an age where all of these things are happening at once. I do think that that is exciting. Well, as I come to the end of our, of our talk, or at least the, uh, the hour of time, so I want to do a Q&A session. Uh, so I'm going to encourage the, uh, the people attending the call to uh, uh, ask questions through the chat or one by one, if you're uh, more comfortable with unmuting yourself, uh, go ahead and ask a question. But uh, uh, I'll go ahead and ask the first question myself. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, in doing all this uh, research for the book, what, what surprised you the most or what jumped out at oh, you? Oh boy, Whew, everything surprised me, honestly. You know, I, uh, uh, it, the research process for this book was very intense. I read over, you know, a hundred books. I went to research libraries. I read thousands of pages of archival material. I interviewed people. I watched a movie a day, sometimes more than one movie a day. So, I mean, every day I felt like I was hitting something that really surprised me. The, the most, a lot of the most exciting surprises was just learning about what Russian culture was like in the 19th century. That was really a fascinating, edifying, wonderful journey. Um, to me, I think one of the greatest surprises in the book, one of my favorite discoveries in the book, uh, which you can feel in the book if you read it, is um, getting to watch the movies of John Garfield, um, who is the first Method movie star and is a truly brilliant actor. He's also very sexy, which makes those movies kind of fun to watch. But, you know, he's a truly, truly brilliant actor who starts with the group. He's a, 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 a Jewish actor who um, his original name was Julius Garfinkel, you know, and he becomes the first major method movie star. His career is ruined by the blacklist. He dies at a very young age of a heart attack while under investigation by HUAC. But he made a bunch of really, 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 truly great movies. And um, he is wonderful in them. Uh, he's wonderful, even in the really bad ones. <laughs> and so getting to watch a bunch of his movies and learn about his work and his life was probably my favorite discovery. And as a theater director, do you often uh, work with actors that have different approaches? Yeah, everyone and has a different you... approach today. Yeah, yeah, everyone has a different approach today. And so what you have to do in the rehearsal room is figure out how to talk to each individual actor in a way that they will understand what you're saying and respond to it. So a lot of times directors, including myself, will talk about, you know, so what do you think's going on here? You know, you're not going to say, why don't you do a sense memory exercise or whatever? You're going to be like, so what do you think the character wants here? You know, let's shape this. Let's talk about what the end goal is. And then you let the actor bring their own training and their own approach to realize that end goal. You Makes set sense. the task. You let them figure out how to achieve that task. That's really the only way you can do it unless as you have what the group had, which was a fixed ensemble of actors who all have the same vocabulary. And then you can use the same, uh, you know, argot back and forth. Uh, Mary yeah. Jo, I see your thing in the chat and, and uh, uh, you're welcome. I love that movie. You know, I watched, uh, uh, yes, that is John Garfield in Gentleman's Agreement. Uh, Mary Jo is asking, um, which Kazan directed and won uh, uh, um, the Oscar for. Um, Gentleman's Agreement. Yes, John Garfield is the Jewish friend in a Gentleman's Agreement. It's one of the only movies where he explicitly plays a Jewish character. He often plays an ethnic immigrant, or there's he's sort of coded as ethnic, but they rarely say that he's Jewish. And he actually took a big pay cut because he was a huge star. I mean, he was a huge star when he made that movie. And he made it for scale. He made it for union, the union scale weekly wage instead of his normal 
asking price because he cared so much about its um, message about uh, anti-Semitism and polite society that he just wanted to help it get made by having his name attached to it. Uh, then when it was time for Kazan to direct Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway, the producer, Irene Selznick, wanted John Garfield to play Stanley Kowalski. And John Garfield, because he had just made this movie with Kazam for next to no money, he wanted, now he was like, well, now's my payday. And his salary demands were so great that um, the negotiations broke down. And that's why Marlon Brando played Stanley Kowalski in the original Broadway production of uh, Streetcar Named Desire. And that was quite, that was quite a, a lot going on in the production because of the different approaches between uh, uh, Marlon Brando and Jessica Tandy. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. Fireworks, fireworks. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, Lori Scott is asking about, uh, was method acting an attempt to help the acting arts catch up with the depth ambiguity paradox of 7th century painting, Rembrandt Caravaggio, 19th century lit Tolstoy Dostoevsky? Um, that's a really interesting question. I will say that all of those acting teachers, Stella Adler in particular, really loved all those artists that you are, that you mentioned there. And she, you know, Stella Adler has this really great way of describing what she called modern acting, which is the umbrella that method acting falls under, which is that Modern acting is about bringing that sense of depth, ambiguity, and paradox into, because that is what modern playwriting is doing, starting roughly with Ibsen and the naturalistic writers of the 19th century, that they are about people who on some level can't be under, do not understand themselves and cannot be understood. And those people are facing problems that can't really be solved within the confines of the play. Like at the end of Hamlet, everyone is dead, right? So like the problem of Hamlet is solved, everyone's dead. At the end of A Doll's House, Nora walks out on Torvald, but none of her problems have actually been solved, right? So because the problem of the modern human being is modernity itself. And so this was an acting style and acting technique that was in part to help express those literary ideas through the actor. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. But that's what Stella Adler really thought they were doing. Um, and I find that very moving as an artistic project. Good. And uh, anybody else have a question for Mr. Butler? Okay. I think that's well, I it. Think, I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, this, I really enjoyed your book. I'll, I'll uh, talk it up to people I know. It's available. Please do. It's available everywhere, uh, uh, especially at the Literati Bookstore in Ann Arbor. And uh, thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for attending it. It was a good talk. Good night. Good night.